You're listening to Two Smart Assets with Chris Thompson and Danny Nichols. This is your source for passive investing in real estate syndications. It's time for us to gain knowledge and take action. So let's go. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. This is the Two Smart Assets Podcast. I am your host, Danny Nichols, here once again with the greatest co-host of all time, Chris Thompson. I appreciate you, Danny, man. It's good to see you. It's good to see you, too. You know, this week we bring on another great guest. It seems like every week we just keep getting these great guests, but uh, we talk, talk about a lot of good stuff. So tell the listeners what we're talking about this week. Okay, so today we brought in Yosef Lee. Uh, Yosef is an accomplished attorney out of New York. He's a very smart, very ambitious guy. Uh, we talked about how uh, we talked about his love for multifamily investing and why that is going to be uh, his investment vehicle of choice. Uh, we also talked about the importance of education and the importance of uh, you know building your team through networking. You know while you're investing at a distance. Yeah, a lot of great stuff, and I can't wait to jump into it. But a couple quick things before we get started. If you're a passive investor or looking to get into passive investing, head over to our website at twosmartassets.com. There we have some great resources for passive investors. You can get our guide to passive investing in apartment syndications. Just a quick overview about how you can get started in apartment syndication investing as a passive uh, investor. Or check out our sample deal. It's going to give you an idea of what you can expect to receive from an operator when an opportunity comes your way. Uh, this is really going to get you ready for when those real deals come across your desk. Be primed and ready to take advantage of those opportunities. If you have any questions about the topics that come up in these resources, don't hesitate to send us a message. You can go to our website again, twosmartassets.com on the contact us page. Drop us a line there. Or you can also find us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, we're all over them, uh, posting multiple times every weekday. Send us a message or drop a comment in one of our posts. We'd love to connect with everybody. Also, if you're a fan of the show, please head over to iTunes and leave us a rating and written review. Um, it really helps us uh, reach more like-minded individuals, grow our podcast so we can help as many people as possible, because that's really the goal of the show is uh, really just help as many people as possible, achieve financial freedom through passive real estate investing uh, in syndication. So, if you could do that for us, we'd greatly appreciate it. All right, well, let's jump into the show. Hey everybody, today's guest is Yosef Lee. Yosef is an attorney who is substantially knowledgeable and experienced in all aspects of civil litigation with special concentration on liability insurance, alternate dispute resolution, and trial. He is licensed to practice law in the, United, in the states of New York, New Jersey, and Florida. He is also a licensed real estate broker in New York. Wow. In regard to investing in multifamily real estate, Yosef focuses on acquiring 30 to 90 unit multifamily apartments that are underperforming, which can be repositioned to increase the net operating income. He is exceptionally efficient in underwriting, due diligence, strategic planning, negotiations, and investor partner relations. Being well-versed with the legal and entrepreneurial competencies, Yosef has deservedly earned trust or investor's trust, both institutional and private. Throughout his career, he has formed a vibrant network of people that includes a group of high net worth individuals and high income earning professionals seeking to deploy their capital and cash flowing real estate investments. Syndicro and Partners Capital was founded with the vision of serving their needs. Joseph is most passionate about resolving conflicts and challenges, attaining financial freedom and control, and helping others reach the same. He is a father of two beautiful girls. He loves arts, music, and performance, and he likes to be involved in community works. Joseph, it's great to see you, man. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Chris and Daniel. I'm honored to be here. Absolutely. We're, we're honored to have you on the show, man. We're excited to dive into some of these topics today. So we're just going to get right into it. So um, with our show, uh, we really talk a lot about um, multifamily, you know, investing in multifamily properties, uh, specifically passively, but we talk a lot, uh, the whole gamut really. So we touched on it briefly in your bio, your focus is multifamily real estate. And you know, there are a ton of different ways to invest in real estate, right? We know that. Why did you decide to focus on multifamily instead of, say, some other niche? Uh, of course. So briefly, multifamily has whole different kinds of benefits. So let's say it's like, let's just pick a handful. Uh, you know, housing trends exhibit a strong demand for rental properties. And as you know, right, millennials are not buying homes anymore. Baby boomers are retiring and they want to downsize into a simpler life, so to say. Um, and it's, it's costing really a high to build a new apartment. So existing apartments are really good fit for this kind of lifestyle. So demand is very high. And also, um, I'll, I'll think about inflation hatch, right? 
the national average inflation rate is two to three percent every year, uh, but national average rent growth is like three to five percent. I mean, nowadays because Corona, it might have gone down a little bit. However, historically and traditionally, that that's the case. Uh, which means if you just have your money sitting in the savings bank, which gives you like less than one percent, you're gonna lose value every year, and we'll know that, right? Right. Um, and as opposed to the commercial lease, this residential lease uh, has a shorter term. So, mm. you know, you can, you can turn around and have a fast rent growth, right? Obviously, right. Uh, monthly cash flow is, is the big thing. You're going to get like each month rent. And that's, that's most, I think, uh, uh, the huge benefit of multifamily investing. Uh, tax benefits, rental income is a passive income with various tax benefits. And especially when you think about depreciation, accelerated depreciation deductions, all different sorts of tax benefits there. Uh, my mentor told me, it's not only about what you make, it's also about what you keep, right? Mm -hmm. I love as, that. Yeah, and since myself is W2 uh, earner as an attorney, uh, you make money, but three, 40, 30 or 40% of the money is gone after your tax, if you think about it, right? Yeah. And, and the most scary statement I heard about uh, this situation was, I think it was Robert Kiyosaki's book or something. He said, look, think it this way, from January to March, uh, late March, you're actually working for free for the government. Wow. Right? Yeah. Because you get 30, yeah. 40%. You're working for free. Um, so that's, that's one, tax benefits, one thing, right? Uh, I will say appreciation is another thing, right? Economies of scales, one family house, two fam uh, duplexes and triplexes. I mean, you know, the larger, the easier to manage and it's cheaper to manage. That's what economies of scale is, right? You, you have 30 unit apartment building in, in one roof. Uh, as, as opposed to you have 30 different single family houses scattered here and there, All right? Uh, so it's, it's no brainer. These are a couple of things that I wanted to pinpoint as to why I chose multifamily over other uh, uh, real estate vehicle. Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of great stuff on there and all the points you made, I think uh, we, we can all agree on uh, why, uh, uh, you know, multifamily uh, commercial real estate is is uh, a great thing to invest in. Two things that I wanted to touch on real quick uh, is that really stuck out to me. Uh, obviously, they're all very good, like I said before, but the economies of scale. This is the reason kind of why we got into it, you know, because uh, we started doing single family homes and with, uh, and just the idea of scaling as quickly with single family homes, it just wasn't going to happen, you know. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, being able to um, invest in large multifamily properties and commercial real estate, other niches as well. Uh, but uh, it, it really was uh, the power of the economies of scale and taking advantage of that kind of drew us to that. Uh, another one uh, that I think is also important that you touched on is the demographic shifts. You know, you talk about millennials and baby boomers and kind of seeing how that's trending and, you know, the way things are heading into the future. And I think that's going to be huge for, um, you know, investing in multifamily real estate or just investing in real estate in general and then also where to invest in these properties you know if you you can invest anywhere across the united states but uh i think the demographics are really going to play a big part of that uh, going forward so kind of moving on yeah kind of going on moving on into the next thing so you know we know you made the choice to start investing in multifamily properties and um you know when you first started out were you looking uh in markets, maybe like your backyard, or were you looking at markets, long distance markets? What's your, what were you initially looking at? So after I finally settled down as to what my investment vehicle would be, I, I started looking for a place to invest, right? Just, just like you said. Right. Um, I hear, I hear from a lot of people that, oh, you should start in your own backyard. That's easier. That's safer. But however, to me, it, it did not really make sense in New York City, right? It's, it's a I will say it's a big institutional money playground. Well, you may be able to own like a couple of units, your own, right? However, I, I didn't think you could go bigger than that as an individual. Uh, so I, I will look at New York City as like an appreciation market. What I mean by that is you would make a lot of money when you actually sell the property after the price gets appreciated, right? However, right. Uh, 
the entry bar, I'll say that the entry price is really high. So the cap rate is, is like only two to 4%, wow. right? And cash and cash, cash and cash return is not that great. Um, so this goes against my goal of like creating passive income generating system, because once you sell that, you make money, but you own no more. So you got to find another and then just sort of, there are a lot of flippers here, unless, unless you're like institutional money, the individuals, they have a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uh, flippers here. Um, however, uh, states like Southeast, Tennessee, Florida, Midwest, like Kansas City, uh, Texas, you know, Georgia, these states, the property will appreciate less as, compa as compared to New York or California, like coastal line states. However, it will have like this strong cash flow with very attractive return because the entry price is relatively lower, uh, but yet the, the property will also appreciate somewhat. So it's like the icing on the cake. Right, so it's suitable for buy and hold strategy, and that's one thing I wanted to establish and and uh, and the later part of my life. Absolutely, I think um, I think it's great, and and the thing you know, listen to you talk about it. You know, you, you're investing in uh, or you're looking at New York, and you know, high prices. You know, it's an appreciation type of market, but your strategy is more focused on uh, cash flow, which I think is you know super important, at, le at least to us as well. Uh, but not only that, but you're kind of getting a dynamic duo of cash flow and some appreciation in these markets, right? So uh, you've started uh, looking at other, you know, like you said, Southeast Florida. And in the center, uh, central states, you know, Kansas or stuff like Kansas City, uh, Texas, stuff like that. These are all these are all great markets, you know. And I think it has a lot to do with kind of what you're saying, just the opportunity. But then also, if you look at some of those those areas, if you look at the demographics, let's just take Texas and Florida. We've talked about Texas and Florida many times on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you look at the trends in those states, I mean. They're great, right? I mean, people are flocking to those states. They're job or business friendly, uh, no state income tax. There's a, a lot of great reasons uh, to look at these areas. So I yeah. think that's I think that's pretty great that you've uh, you've you've decided to look at long like other markets outside of your the market where you live. Um, but the the thing that I hear from uh, a number of uh, investors, and actually this is kind of how I felt. Um, when I first started, I think Chris was the same way, but uh, you know, some people don't like the idea of long distance investing. You know, they can't see or visit the property oh, yeah. regularly, right. or they're not there to handle the issues that, that come up, but mm -hmm. you seem to be comfortable with it, investing out of state for, you know, you look at the trends and all that stuff, but why aren't you afraid of long distance investing? And what are some of the steps maybe uh, that our listeners can take to be more comfortable with that type of investing? All right, well, man, I, I'm ready to tackle that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, in the beginning, I, I, you know, as I started seeing the opportunities in these areas, Southeast, Midwest, I was a little afraid and it would be lying if I did, if I was not, right? Um, however, I started thinking, okay, so, you know, should I first try in my backyard still, or maybe a suburb of New York City, close to where I am, right? But then I asked, but then I asked myself again, well, what is my ultimate goal, right? Again, it, it, it comes comes back to my ultimate goal. It is to become multifamily investor, and eventually achieve financial freedom and control. I I did not want to become a landlord for a single family or duplex where I had to look after day-to-day -day operations. Even though I can own something close to my home, it's not like I would personally go there, fix the toilet, <laughs> pick, pick up the tenants' clothes, et cetera, anyway, right? So I'll, I'm going to hire a handyman and property manager anyway here in New York. I'm not going to go there every week or something then why, why not do it in a state where the numbers make more sense, right? Perfect answer. Right? And, and then I, I, I can become, you know, like an asset manager, managing the property managers. In other words, being a landlord to me was like having another W2 job because mm -hmm. you're going to have to physically tie to it. And again, it, 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 it goes against my goal. So I didn't want that. With this conviction, I was able to overcome my fear of investing out of state. 
yeah uh, I think that's that, a, go ahead please i say yeah i think that's pretty powerful and i i love the fact that you talked about basically not creating another job for yourself i mean you said you you know you're a lawyer you're i'm sure you're busy all the time and be able to be, to become a property manager and, and do these things man that's gonna eat up a lot of time because you know tenants toilets termites things like that i mean that's a <laughs> headache for sure so um uh yeah i'm right. glad to hear that you decided not to do that and the reasons you've decided to invest out of state um right. so what are some of the things when you talk about investing out of state um and you know you kind of touched on a uh, property management and you know having a third party property manager what are some good ways or some tips or team building strategies that maybe you could implement to uh, really create a, a good a good structure and a good team frame uh, around you know being able to invest out of state what are some of those key pieces do you think that, that is are they vital uh, for success in that area okay so naturally i decided to invest out of state the natural next step that I had naturally thought about was, okay, so who am I going to uh, have an out of state that I could trust, that I could rely on, that could be my point person, right? Right. So that's where I started thinking, okay, I need, I need uh, someone. I need to team up. And that goes with the whole notion of, okay, why I want to do a multifamily. If I want to do single family or duplex, and I approach to, let's say, some of the local people, uh, local investors oh you want to partner with me i have one one house i'm looking at i have duplex here instead of that if i could if i could approach saying oh i have a 20 unit i'm looking at i have 35 i have 50 unit i'm looking at i need a team you want to be in it which one sounds more attractive right we got to have a bigger pie to attract more people Absolutely. so that was that was uh one thing and secondly um i, I think well, this, this, I'm going to touch point on this one when I talk about education, but before selecting any team, uh, I think you should select a market first. Mm. Um, but anyway, that's this later part. So let's say, let's hypothetically, let's say you already selected a market, right? Then now you got a network. Be active in investors groups like biggerpockets.com, you know, other Facebook groups or local meetups, et cetera. Uh, these days you could do it virtually. A lot of real estate meetups are virtually right since this COVID and I mean you can do it alone but like I said if, if you have all the resources and a great amount of luck yeah go for it however it's not a good idea I think you need to find partners who have different strengths than yours first right who share the same vision and strategies with you if my strategy is go after 30 50 units but you want to go after like only 10 units obviously we're not going to work together so for example also, you, you might be a number person and you can be the one underwriting the deals with Excel sheets. Well, uh, or you might be the boots on the ground to be a contact person to speak to local brokers or, you know, checking out the properties. Or you might be the one who is a good at capital raising. So the question is not only what value the potential partners bring to you, but also what value you can add to them. So you've got to have that approach. You can, you can have as many partners, partners as you want, but I recommend to partner up with, you know, at least with some one experienced investor and one boots on the ground. Like those three uh, lags are, I think, the core members. Uh, but you got to know what you are. Again, in my case, for example, I'm not a boots on the ground, obviously, right? I'm out of state investor. Um, I'm not, you know, I wasn't like a huge, like many, many years of experience. Uh, was syndications. So I had to, what I had to do is first analyze myself, try to see what I'm good at and try and see how I could add value to potential partners. Right. And for me, like having a boots on the ground partner, it was critical because again, out of state, I got to have someone I could rely on. So I started looking for uh, someone who could be a boots on the ground. Um, a lot of people told me that, you know, a lot of, you know, as you know, a lot of people are trying to make a, make a team. They're, they're trying to uh, form a partnership. Um, one thing I hear a lot was that when they find the partners, some people come and they say, oh, I'll do whatever I, uh, what, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. Uh, 
if somebody says that, it's like creating more job for them because they yeah. now have to figure out like what you're good at and right. Um, I mean, it's good energy. You 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 know you're willing to do anything that's good. However, tell me like who you are, right? What, what are you good at? So my approach was like, okay, I'm a lawyer. I could read all the uh, legal documents. Uh, I'm uh, also I could I could renegotiate the the service contractor's terms, right? And save money that way. Uh, I could review the PSA, you know, some simple legal documents I could, I could create myself. So overall, we're going to significantly reduce uh, the attorney fees. And also, um, I could structure the business. Uh, you know, I live in New York, so I could work as like a capital raiser. So I, I you know, actually, I delineated all these things and then I put myself out there okay, is there anyone who can be my boots on the ground? And luckily, um, there was a great guy uh, who approached it to me. We met through a mentorship group, and then we started talking, and he said, that's exactly what I need, right? And he was a boots on the ground. He wanted to focus on the tenant relationship, you know, local uh, businesses. So our interest just clicked, and we had another uh, partner who was from California who could be, uh, another capital raiser. So like overall, our team is, I think, very strong at this, at this point. So that's the core team. And I also call another secondary team. Uh, those are, um, you know, like real estate, local real estate brokers, property managers and lenders. And third members, you can further get referrals from the secondary team members, such as title companies, home inspectors, et cetera. So there's a tier I, I think most important thing is you you got to create the core member first. Absolutely. I, I, go ahead, Chris. No, I, I think you hit some pretty good points actually. And I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought up. Um, I'm glad you brought up like the, the self perspective or, you know, self introspective, trying to figure out what you're good at. Cause you know, Danny and I, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, <clears throat> understanding what your strong suits are and being able to, to leverage those with others and, or I guess leverage somebody else's strong suits. But I think it's extremely important that you need to figure out what you're good at first. Just like you said, like, I love the eagerness and the energy of tell me what I need to do. But just like you said, like, I'm not, yeah, I couldn't actually repeat it better than you said, but I think that, I think that's huge. Um, I was curious, you know, considering like everything that's been going on this year and the dramatic events, like, has that changed the way you, uh, any of your tactics in terms of uh, uh, the, the actual networking, you know, cause a lot of stuff is kind of shut down in terms of being able to meet you face to face. Is anything mm -hmm. changing in your world of how you network? So it's just, I don't, yeah, I don't want to sound like, um, you know, brutal or anything, but I think some, some portion of the COVID situation, I'm thankful. What I mean by that is because of its Corona situation, a lot of things were shifted to, uh, you know, uh, cloud-based, internet-based, uh, virtual, which worked out perfectly for me. As, as you said, I'm a busy professional during the, my day job, right? I'm only investor at night and weekends. Courts were closed all. So I had to use virtual uh, conference tools for the courts as well. So those kind of things kind of worked out. So I was able to actually uh, network a lot more and freely with a lot of other real estate investors because of the Zoom, Skype, so all these virtual tools. So it actually worked out for me in terms of uh, networking wise. And I kind of see that before COVID, uh, people were like, uh, you know, yeah, let me just, let's just meet up, right? You know, I like to be in person in person. Yeah. But now most of the people like, oh yeah, I'll send you Zoom, I'll send you Skype. Right, that's so much easier, and like like we're connected like this. We are boundless. I do I do a New York meetup here, Multifamily Investors Network, New York, uh, with with uh, my co-host uh, Nico. Before COVID, it was an uh, in-person meetup. I was not part of it. I started going there when it turned into a virtual, and then Nico did not have any intention to turn it into a virtual until we uh, had like a month in or half, or like two weeks in after Corona. And then he started talking about making this virtual. And then that's how I got hooked up with him and started talking about doing it together, et cetera. 
But once we turn this into a virtual meetup, now it's boundless. Now this guy from California, this guy from Tennessee, this guy from Florida can come in and it's a, a, a lot better now, right? Instead of just some New York guys coming together and talk. Now we could talk about out of state flawlessly. It's a lot better. So I, I think, yeah, so back to your, your question, Chris, um, how Corona affected the way I approach. I, I think it's just making it, making it better and better, right? Good, I, I don't think I could actually agree more. It's, it just opens up so many doors. And I think, uh, like you were kind of mentioning before, you know, I, I enjoy the, the, the personable, like the interaction, but really, you know, this goes perfectly in line with what we want to be doing long-term anyways, which is remotely investing, you know, living abroad, living, you know, in Hawaii, where I don't have to go anywhere that I don't want to. and Everybody's very comfortable with using all this, uh, you know, the cloud-based stuff. So I think it's working out perfectly in, in a handful of different ways, really. Right, right. And now people are looking at the, when they rent or lease, they, they look the apartment through like virtual uh, tour. Uh, this is absolutely cool, I think. I mean, it, it's been there before, but now a lot more people are uh, willing to do that, right? And, and enjoy the function of technology. I, I think it's great. It is great. And I, I, I totally agree with about uh, the networking and how the, the current situation has kind of accelerated, uh, actually, the networking that has been occurring. And, you know, I've heard from a few people, you know, because things got crazy there for a while and they're still a little bit crazy but they basically are talking about taking their foot off the gas when it comes to networking and talking to people and when the reality is my first thought was you need to mash on the gas and be networking twice as much you know so uh i think that's uh i i i'm totally agreeing with you guys about um, the importance of networking and how it's kind of transitioned to what we're doing now and i think it's great well, um can i add one more thing on that networking? Absolutely. so I want to I want to just add about the importance of having mastermind group here. Uh, I mean, going to something like going to bigger pockets and being part of like a Facebook groups is also good, but like being closely connected with like-minded people and having like an accountability group is is absolutely critical because this this is a long journey. You're not gonna it's, it's not like an overnight being a rich quick kind of scheme right it's mm -hmm. we were thinking about five years seven years ten years and slowly for sh for surely though um so that is a marathon so it's, it's critical to have people around you especially like-minded who could support you who could share the idea of being an investor multi-family uh, it's critical and because that i think you better have a mentor it having a mentor tremendously uh, lowered my learning curve here. And being in this, this type of mastermind group or bigger pockets, the networking is more organic. Uh, um, what I mean by that is, is we don't have to convince like why multifamily is good. Like, mm -hmm. like just like Chris, Daniel, as soon as we met, we could talk about multifamily. Absolutely. It's, it's that organic because this is like-minded people. And therefore, the networking is more quick. It doesn't mean that it's shallow, right? But since these are filtered group of people, they connect like, boom, organically. And all oh, you need that kind of people. I know this guy. Hold on. Let me, let me text him and I could connect you guys right there. That's actually what I'm doing and what I'm being done to. So uh, being in a uh, mastermind group or group of like-minded people is absolutely critical. I think, uh, yeah, I, I can, couldn't agree more with that. You know, what I've noticed personally, even just recently is, is the community involved, you know, the community that you're talking about, uh, you know, even a mastermind or just kind of people we associate ourselves with yeah. in the multifamily investing space. They're so giving, you know, it, there's, it's not like we're competing. Obviously we're, you know, we're all trying to invest in multifamily real estate, but the, everybody's so giving and so nice. We just want to promote each other and help each other as much as possible. Okay. And, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to find a community like that anywhere else. So I think, I think it's great. Oh, uh, yeah. and, and I totally agree with what you're saying about that. Um, I one thing. I want to shout out um, my group, Jake and Gino and MIH Mess Mind. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Right. Yeah. Make Good guy. For sure. All right. 
All right, so uh, one thing I want to talk about before we get out of here, because we're going low on time, is, you know, we talk a lot about education on this show and, and kind of how we educate ourselves and kind of educational tools. Talk to us a little about uh, the importance of education real quick. Okay, sure. Sorry, I talked too much. I, I <laughs> know, but, um, all right, so I think education is basic. Well, one thing that I was able to overcome the fear was by education. If I didn't know, I could... Uh, look at outside of my boundary and I could have like partner there if I had not known about that I would have not made a decision to look at outside even right um, and if you don't educate yourself you don't know what you don't know I think you would absolutely agree to that so I, I think education is the basic but it's, it's most important thing so a couple of couple of things that you sh you must be educated about to become like multifamily investor will be how to select the market right first thing um, you, know, you gotta know, uh, you gotta be able to read the numbers, uh, population growth, um, you know, crime rates, uh, house value, condo value growth, media income growth, job growth rates, all these affect uh, if which market is good market. For example, the, the market I'm looking at Kansas City has steady population growth and job growth. Whereas some part of the Ohio I looked at has like a steady decrease of population in certain part of the uh, state. So you gotta be able to see these things to determine which market you're gonna go. Right. right. If you have, if you chose wrong market, even though you have a good partner in different market, they, he cannot help you, right? Right. So that's one thing you gotta be able to learn some essential terms like, you know, what net operating income is, capitalization rate is, cash and cash return, to be able to see if, like, if deal is a good deal, how can your project? Uh, the future uh, return on investment without knowing all these terms and right so you got to be able to see you got to be able to read the, the finance financial portion of the uh, of the packages etc right? right and you got to be able to know how to value the property absolutely also we, oh go ahead as i say we we talk a lot about this stuff uh you know kind of the stuff we post on social media and all the stuff we kind of talk to uh, uh, other investors about kind of exactly what you're saying getting educated on the basics you know understand the language and the terminology uh, is going to be critical to your success going forward because when you interact with other investors or you know you said brokers or lenders or age you know anybody you're going to want to be able to speak the language at least relatively well you know uh to be taken uh, seriously so totally agree with that uh, and you know just the idea of having uh, that education and the importance of that education is absolutely critical Right, right, right. And, you know, you got to be able to set your asset management plans, your strategy, how long you want to hold this property. Is it you want to, do you want to, what is your exit strategy? You want to sell it or you want to refinance it and hold it further? You know, things like that. You, you got to educate yourself so that you could have a better investment vehicle for your future investors. You got to be able to explain why you believe this is good investment, right? Right. Absolutely. Um, those are uh, those were the basic things that you should, you must educate yourself about. Perfect. Love it, man. It's been. Go ahead, Chris. I, I was actually curious. You know, you're talking about like negotiating, and uh, you know that's one of your one of your strong suits. And, and you know, just being that you're on the front lines of renegotiating deals and stuff like that. Um, again, bring this back to COVID. Like, is there any? Whether they're long term or short short term are there any like emerging trends or anything that you're that you're seeing or that you're anticipating moving forward in terms of renegotiating uh, some of these deals um negotiating wise well we'll look at we, uh, when we when we underwrite a deal we become more conservative right because there are some of the sellers still have the pick mindset uh, that they were enjoying before the COVID. So they were not coming down, but we know for sure there's not going to be any buyer uh, who's going to pay that kind of money. So now we're more confident to submit a, a letter of intent based on our projection, our performa, our underwriting. And even though the seller is not meeting that, um, we, could, we could be more patient away because we know the seller is going to come down at one point. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. And another th trend I see is when we underwrite, uh, we project like a year first or two years. We don't uh, have like a rent bump. We don't we don't account rent raise, just to be conservative, just to do like a stress test. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I see uh, as a trend that people uh, apply like zero rent growth for the first two years and see this through this stress test if the deal is still surviving. 
to see. So this is like cash flowing as before you even acquire it, it's cash flowing and yes, going yes. just fine. Yeah. Right, right, right. That's great stuff. That's been a, uh, uh, that's, that's, I totally agree with all that, but uh, we're running out of time here. So um, this has been a great conversation before we actually run out of time. We want to shine the spotlight on you, Yosef. So tell us what the listeners have going or what you have going on. So working hard with my W2 job, which I love, I love being a lawyer. I love the process. That's what I fell uh, in love with. I love the process of moving from the beginning to the end, gathering the information. So this is similar to being a syndicator, right? You, uh, you gather all the data, you, you pull the team together, you make sure this is a good deal. Uh, it's like a sort of collecting the evidence and you present it to uh, the, the investors. It's like presenting my case to the judge and try to convince that why my case is better than, than uh, defend, defendant's argument, right? So right. these are exactly what I like about the process and connecting the dots. Like a lot of people, uh, I love seeing these people are uh, being in a one team and being connected and I, I think it's absolutely great. So that's, and my, my two kids are grown up. So I love them. Uh, these, these perfect. They're being just so demanding these days about the time. So that's one <laughs> thing. That's, that's one thing I want to achieve financial freedom and control. Right. So that I could spend more time with my family uh, yet still working, uh, not physically demanding jobs. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, tell, tell the listeners how they can get a hold of you. So I have a website. It's called syndicro.com. S-Y-N-D-I-C-R-O.com. Uh, and I have a Facebook page and Instagram. It's called the Million Door Club. Uh, it's like my vision of myself and my friends and families and who, whomever knows me all together. We want to own Million Door. So it's like kind of my vision. It's a Million Perfect. Door Club, is it? That's awesome. Okay, well, we'll, we'll link to all your stuff in the show notes so our listeners can get a hold of you. Uh, Yosef, it's been great having you on the show. Thanks for talking with us. Uh, that's all we have for today. To our listeners, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Thank, Thank you, you, Chris. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, it, was, it was my pleasure. Absolutely. Take care. Hey, thanks for listening to today's episode. Head over to iTunes to subscribe to the show, and while you're there, we really appreciate you leaving a rating and written review. If you have any questions or topics you'd like to hear on the show, Connect with us on social media or through our website at twosmartassets.com. We look forward to speaking to each and every one of you. Talk to you soon.